We may be living in the most confused age in human history. Socially, scientifically, and morally, we are losing our footing and abandoning, in a multitude of ways, any semblance of sure foundations. The words male and female, boy and girl, man and woman, and husband and wife, words that only a handful of years ago would be plainly understood by nearly every human being in Western civilization, even the whole world, are now up for grabs, stirring confusion, sorrow, anger, protest, and even hate. The transgender movement is asking all of us to redefine some of the most basic concepts of human society and civilization. Consequently, some of the foundations of society and civilization are dissolving beneath our feet. And while, as the movement grows, all of us are impacted in one way or another, often the most tragic victims of society's growing confusion are children, the most innocent and vulnerable among us. Exactly what is the transgender movement asking of us? How did we get here? And what does it all mean? And how do we find peace, understanding, and stability once again? Today, we'll answer those questions and more as we explain all you need to know about the transgender issue. Come with me and our crew here for this special edition of Tomorrow's World as we explore these questions and provide the answers few are willing to give. Join us as we show you the truth about the transgender movement. Welcome to this special presentation of Tomorrow's World, the truth about the transgender movement. It shouldn't be a complicated topic, yet it has become one and one of the most contentious topics of our modern age. Western civilization has produced the musical genius of Mozart and the mathematical and scientific insight of Isaac Newton. Plumbed the depths of the atom in the quantum world, constructed continuously inhabited outposts in space, and given the world the plays of Shakespeare, the art of Rembrandt and Caravaggio, and the noble beauty of the King James translation of the Bible. Yet somehow, at this moment in history, we can't decide which bathrooms and locker rooms people should use. We are in a moment of utter confusion. How do we come to be in a place where some of the most fundamental words of the English language, man and woman, boy and girl, male and female, are increasingly becoming utterly meaningless. Words that no one seems to be able to define anymore, sparking controversy, lawsuits, protests, and even violence. Is the problem really that bad? How deep does it go? And how do we find the truth amidst the noise and confusion that surround the transgender issue? On this program, we're going to look at the transgender ideology and the impact it is having on society at large and on the lives of individuals, and we'll explain the plain and simple truth. Before we begin, though, we need to make two things very clear. First, we need to admit up front that the topic of transgender ideology and confusion about sex and gender is not an easy one for some to discuss comfortably. While we will avoid being unnecessarily graphic, the subject, by its nature, touches explicitly upon sensitive topics that we normally do not go into detail about on our weekly Tomorrow's World telecasts. As a result, you may choose to watch this program first on your own without children in the room until you're comfortable that the content is suitable for them. We expect that those of our viewers who are parents take their obligations very seriously, and we appreciate that. Secondly, this subject needs to be approached with compassion and sincere love for those who are struggling with it. Many individuals are truly suffering in confusion, hurt, pain, and sadness. Many are wrestling with feelings they do not always understand and struggling against pain, awkwardness, and heartbreak for which they see no relief in their futures. And often they're searching for answers in a world that sometimes seems to be designed to confuse them, mislead them, and take them from pain and hurt to false relief that in the end turns only into more pain and hurt. On Tomorrow's World, we never hold back from calling out sin and confusion for what it is. And yet Christ warns us against being too quick to condemn. 
When his disciples, John and James, were too eager to call fire down from heaven to destroy those who had shown Jesus disrespect, were told, he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Every human being, including any who are part of the transgender movement, are struggling with gender dysphoria and confusion. Every single one is created in the image of God. He loves them and cares for them. And the Son of God, the Savior of the world, died for them so that they would have an opportunity to one day know the truth, to know the purpose of their lives, to repent and to grow in peace, wisdom, and love, in a loving relationship with their Creator. Such individuals do not deserve abuse or hatred. What they need is help, love, and truth precious commodities in a world that advances its own priorities in the guise of help, depicts real love as if it were hate, and builds its worldviews and philosophies on foundations of lies and falsehood. Real help, love, and truth are what we will seek to provide on this program. As the Apostle John told his readers, this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. It is love for our fellow man that motivates this program. Love for those who are suffering under gender confusion and for their families, and love for the nations and peoples of the world on whom judgment for sin is coming, and coming much sooner than anyone will expect. We cannot promise you an easy way out of that confusion but we will do our best to dispel the lies that cloud the way forward and rob you of solid footing and to provide the truth that can help light your way one step at a time. So with those things understood, let's jump in. To some of you, it may seem crazy that we even have to discuss topics such as this. After all, in the world in which you grew up, everything was so relatively simple. You knew what a boy was and what a girl was and what men and women were. Gender wasn't something a doctor assigned at birth when you had a baby and the doctor said you had a boy or you had a girl. The statement wasn't considered a non-binding assignment based simply on the outward appearance of the baby's genitalia, something the child might one day be encouraged by his school or society, let alone by you, to reject in order to embrace his supposed true gender identity. Rather, if the doctor said, you have a boy, it was because, well, you had a boy. And if it was, you have a girl, it was because you had a girl. In the 99.98% .98 of births without certain serious sexual development disorders, that determination at birth was straightforward and uncontroversial. But not anymore. In fact, on June 14th, 2021, the American Medical Association recommended removing sex as a legal designation from public birth certificates to prevent what is now called misgendering. Why? Because today's social engineers tell us that gender is not objectively real. They say it's a mere social construct and that you can do incredible harm to your child by assuming it's gender based on the body you see. Whereas seeing a baby with a penis meant you had a boy, and seeing a baby with a vagina meant you had a girl, we are now to believe it is truly impossible to tell. The baby you believe might be a boy might actually be a girl, or the baby you believe to be a girl might actually grow up to realize she is a man. According to this ideology, gender and sex are completely unrelated. And if you assign a sex or gender to your child, you're virtually committing an act of violence against him or her. Indeed, the media would have us believe that an increasing number of enlightened parents are raising their children completely gender neutral, avoiding even any use of gendered pronouns like him or her, so that their child can one day tell them what gender he or she truly is. Welcome to the new world of transgender ideology and it is coming to a school, hospital, or workplace near you if it's not there already. Back in their June 9th, 2014 issue, 
Time Magazine tried to tell us this was coming. Featuring Laverne Cox, a transgender individual, meaning in Laverne's case, a biological man who wants to be considered a woman, the magazine boldly proclaimed that we had reached the transgender tipping point and declared transgender rights America's next civil rights frontier. If we didn't take time seriously, we should have. Since then, the transgender issue has continued crashing over culture and society like an endless series of waves moving out of their way any traditional understanding of sex and gender that is not firmly anchored to anything solid. Laws have been changed, schools have been changed, and life has been changed. Even our language has been changed. The English word gender has been around since at least the 14th and 15th centuries. It was used to refer to the different grammar categories of some languages, such as French, Spanish, and Portuguese, and it was used also as a synonym for sex. And for the last 600 or so years, saying my gender is male was the same as saying my sex is male. Now activists and the institutions that now side with them tell us that gender is supposed to be fundamentally different and unconnected with sex. Look at this definition of gender in Merriam-Webster's online dictionary. The first definition is the grammar one we mentioned. The second one is sex, just like we would expect. Then it moves to the behavioral, cultural, or psychological traits typically associated with one sex, an understanding that developed especially with the feminist movement in the latter 20th century. Then right below, you'll see gender identity. Now note, that's new. You only have to go back no later than November 25th, 2018, which we are able to do thanks to the Internet Archive website, and you'll see that Merriam-Webster did not have that gender identity as part of the definition of gender. Why not? Because redefining the word gender is the key to achieving the goals of the transgender movement. If they can completely detach gender from sex, then they can use it to sell their ideas. Because our sex is certainly real, the biology is undeniable, and they don't want gender to stand for anything real at all, just your subjective feelings grounded in no objective reality at all. For instance, let's follow the definition. If you click to get a definition of gender identity, you find that it is supposed to mean a person's internal sense of being male, female, some combination of male and female, or neither male nor female. It's the old idea of feeling like a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa. And yet now we're asked to accept the internal sense as the reality and the body as something to be ignored or even changed if need be through chemistry or surgery to match that internal sense. It's literally a picture of attempting to alter reality to fit one's own desires and feelings. And notice the nonsense. No one speaks of being a combination of male and female sexes or of being some third human sex that's neither male nor female. At least they didn't before, and we'll get to that later in our program. But now gender is so vacuous and meaningless that you can supposedly be male, female, both or neither in an infinite spectrum of combinations and possibilities. In fact, in 2014, ABC News in the US reported that social media giant Facebook was now allowing users to select one of up to at least 58 genders. This is the source of all the pronoun wars you may have heard about. Some not content to be able to pick from among he or she and him or her have invented new pronouns to represent their unwillingness to identify with either sex or gender, making up words such as Z or Zer or Zim. Real life and biology define men and women simply based on their roles in reproduction. Men are adult human males who typically produce small gametes called sperm, and women are adult human females who typically produce eggs. Simple, objective, grounded. 
Yet ask a transgender activist the question, what is a woman, and sit back waiting for anything simple, objective, and grounded. Not that they don't try. Often you'll see circular responses, such as, a woman is anyone who identifies as a woman. Or a woman is anyone whose internal sense tells her that she is a woman. But those are nonsense definitions. In fact, how is anyone supposed to know they identify as a woman with a definition like that? It's like saying a cat is an animal that acts like a cat. It's utterly useless. When we abandon reality, only confusion remains. Of course, all of this would be only an academic discussion about some new quirk of modern life if this was as far as things went, right? I mean, most of us grew up hearing occasionally about individuals who believed they were a different sex than the one they actually were, such as a man who felt he was really a woman trapped in a man's body. In that sense, some of this is nothing new. Mankind has been in various states of confusion since Adam and Eve chose the wrong tree in the Garden of Eden. But something has changed in recent years. An entire worldview has been created to normalize such circumstances, not to get help for such an individual, but to tell the rest of the world that such confusion actually points to a more accurate view of reality, in which the fact that we are male or female is determined solely by our feelings and not by biology at all. Hence, we have the bathroom wars of recent years, which now sees biological males using women's bathrooms because they declare they are actually women. Now, when a bearded man decides to change clothes in the same room as a young woman at the gym because he claims he's a woman himself, it is considered a form of bigotry to press him on his identification. After all, if he says he's a woman, who's to disagree? And failing to accept someone's self-identification as a person of the other sex or gender, no matter how politely or respectfully you do so, is considered by some an act of literal violence. You see the shift society is experiencing in the numbers. A 2018 USA Today article cited government data that estimated 0.6% of US adults identified as transgender. Yet the same article reports that a 2016 survey of almost 81,000 Minnesota teens found that nearly 2,200 of them identified as transgender or gender nonconforming. That's around 2.7%, almost quadruple the proportion of adults. As always, if you want to understand the trends, follow the money and a vast amount of cash is being poured into supporting a growing industry based on questioning one's gender and seeking treatments and surgeries to look like the opposite sex. In 2016, Business Insider reported on the beginning of this wave of funding in an article titled, Demand for Transgender Medical Care is Exploding. Thanks to the openness of Caitlyn Jenner and others, public awareness of transgenderism and demand for trans-specific medical care like counseling, hormone treatments, and genital surgery is exploding even for the youngest of patients. At the 30 plus clinics for transgender youth across the US, doctors like Olson Kennedy can barely keep up with the demand. Chicago's Lurie Children's Hospital, for example, opened its trans clinic just four years ago, but already has 500 patients and a four-month waiting list. Seattle Children's Hospital opened its clinic in October and immediately got scores of calls. Olson Kennedy's clinic, the Center for Trans Youth Health and Development at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, is the country's largest, treating 725 trans youth from across the Western US. 500 of those patients are Olson Kennedy's. Her youngest patient is three. Please do not fail to take note of that last statement. Her youngest patient is three. As we'll see, those suffering the greatest under the new regime of transgender ideology are children.
And note as well that this report was from the end of 2016. In May 2021, the Society for Evidence-Based Gender Medicine noted that the total number of clinics and medical offices that provide hormonal interventions to minors is currently estimated at over 300. The hormonal interventions they mention include puberty blockers, hormones designed to prevent a boy or girl from entering puberty when their sex differences increase, such as a boy's facial hair growing and getting a deeper voice, and a girl's breasts growing and her period starting. In the UK, officials are trying to expand access to such services so that anyone can get hormone treatments directly from their general practitioner instead of a special clinic. As reported in May 2021, trans rights activist Dr. Harriet Hutchinson spoke to the British Parliament saying, we think gender identity clinics as a concept should be removed and that access to healthcare like hormone treatment can be made through primary care. Adding, people should have the right to make the changes to their body that they want to. Fundamentally, it is wrong that the psychiatric profession gets to decide whether or not we are who we say we are. This idea of radical self-determination, regardless of objective biological reality, even in defiance of it, was starkly described by an influential transgender writer who goes by the name Andrea Long Chu. As a biological man who identifies as a woman, Chu wrote an article for the New York Times only days before receiving surgery designed to modify male genitals so that they look like female genitals. The article was graphic and unambiguous. Next Thursday, I will get a vagina. The procedure will last around six hours and I will be in recovery for at least three months. Until the day I die, my body will regard the vagina as a wound. As a result, it will require regular, painful attention to maintain. This is what I want, but there's no guarantee it will make me happier. In fact, I don't expect it to. That shouldn't disqualify me from getting it. Chu concludes, let me be clear. I believe that surgeries of all kinds can and do make an enormous difference in the lives of trans people. But I also believe that surgery's only prerequisite should be a simple demonstration of want. Beyond this, no amount of pain anticipated or continuing justifies its withholding. That is the world we've entered, a world defined by nothing but want and promoted in the pages of one of the most influential newspapers in the world. These changes are often irreversible and they're increasingly being made available to minors and children based merely on their feelings robbing them of any hope of one day having children of their own, forever altering their appearance and forever making them dependent on hormone injections and surgeries to maintain the unnatural illusion that their bodies are not the sex they actually are. Children who are considered too young to legally vote, to marry, to volunteer for the military, or even too young to buy a beer are being allowed to make decisions even against their parents' will that will alter their lives forever. Writer Abigail Schreier has done outstanding work investigating the growth and impact of the transgender phenomenon, especially concerning the alarming rise of transgender claims among teenage girls, a development she rightly likens to an epidemic. Her book, Irreversible Damage, The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters, is a must read for anyone trying to understand these developments, their causes, and the depth of the damage caused. In her book, Ms. Schreier identifies several reasons why recent years have seen such an alarming rise in cases of individuals identifying as the opposite gender and seeking medical help to transition through hormones and surgery. One key difference between this and past psychiatric crazes is that the transgender epidemic seems primarily induced by peers and the media and schools. Today's teens don't wait to talk to a therapist to find out what's wrong with them. 
They simply park themselves in front of a screen, Google, am I trans, and self-diagnose from the list of symptoms. If anything, therapists are merely exacerbating or encouraging a problem already begun. This role played by peers, both online and real life, helps to explain part of the unnatural growth that we're seeing in children and young adults suddenly deciding that their gender somehow doesn't match their sex. The influence of peers, the internet, and social media was well documented by Dr. Lisa Littman in a study published in August of 2018. Dr. Littman, now president of the Institute for Comprehensive Gender Dysphoria Research, was motivated to discover why the numbers of adolescent girls identifying as transgender had skyrocketed in recent years in multiple countries. What she had found was that transgender claims and gender dysphoria was in part spreading like a social contagion in which individuals who don't really have a particular problem seem to catch the problem from their exposure to others who claim to have the same problem. She labeled the phenomenon rapid onset gender dysphoria and noted that the patterns of its spread were very similar to other peer contagions, such as what happens with anorexia nervosa, an obsessive and self-destructive desire to lose weight and avoid eating. She is not the first person to make the connection between transgenderism and anorexia. In a 2014 Wall Street Journal article that continues to make waves, highly regarded and influential psychiatrist Dr. Paul McHugh noted, the transgendered suffer a disorder of assumption like those in other disorders familiar to psychiatrists. With the transgendered, the disordered assumption is that the individual differs from what seems given in nature, namely one's maleness or femaleness. Other kinds of disordered assumptions are held by those who suffer from anorexia and bulimia nervosa, where the assumption that departs from physical reality is the belief by the dangerously thin that they are overweight. Dr. Littman had noticed that just as some girls begin to be anorexic after spending time with other girls who are anorexic, transgender feelings were spreading the same way. Not because of some innate sense of being the wrong gender, but due to the influence of friends, peers, and social media. Anorexia and bulimia have inspired an online subculture in which teens encourage others to adopt the pro-Anna lifestyle, turning starving yourself into something praiseworthy. Websites and social media influencers offer tips on how to suppress your hunger pangs as you starve yourself, to hide the fact that you're vomiting up your meals in order to stay thin, and lie to your parents so that they think you're eating. In the same way, online influencers encourage teens to embrace the transgender mindset proclaiming the wonders of how their breast removal or testosterone shots or puberty blockers are positively changing their lives. As adolescents going through the very normal stresses and traumas of adolescence, these influencers provide those adolescents hope that embracing the idea that their gender differs from their body will finally provide the answers they need to make their pain, confusion, and awkwardness go away. As in the case with the pro-anorexia online community, many transgender influencers coach children about how to convince and lie to their parents and the medical system to ensure they get access to all the hormones and surgeries they seek. The internet is a terrible place for children. Yet if there is any safe place for children, surely our schools filled with trained professionals dedicated to our children's welfare might be havens for sanity and safety. But sadly, no. Increasingly, the opposite is true. For instance, in many schools, differing from gender norms is celebrated by teachers and educators declaring oneself to be liberated from traditional gender understanding, embracing a transgender identity or non-heterosexual attractions is praised as brave and courageous. 
Sticking with your biological sex and heterosexuality never is. School and civic calendars feature days, even months, devoted to promoting and praising anything that differs from traditional understanding of sex, sexuality, and gender. Pride Month, LGBTQ History Month, Transgender Visibility Day, International Pronouns Day, Transgender Awareness Week. In DC Comics, even Superman's son came out to readers as a homosexual on coming out day. You would be fooling yourself to think that this atmosphere of celebration and praise does not influence children, does not essentially teach them what is to be admired and highlight identities they should strive for, while teaching by its silence what is not worthy of pride or of being called brave or courageous, traditional gender and sexual understanding. And while parents like to believe the schools are their helpers in educating and guiding their children, bringing subject area and educational expertise to bear, but deferring to parents more broadly in matters such as these concerning gender and sexuality, such parents are in for a rude awakening. Many schools see themselves as the child's advocate above the parent, helping the child to find his or her true gender identity, even if a school has to do so in secret without informing the parents until it is too late. Abigail Schreier quotes C. Scott Miller, fifth grade teacher and board member of Equality California, concerning what recourse parents have when they discover too late that their child is going by a different gender at school and identifying using different gender pronouns. Even parents that come in and say, I don't want my kid to be called that, that's nice, but their parental right ended when those children were enrolled in public school. Suffice it to say, when it comes to the startling rise in gender confusion and the spread of transgender ideology, Western civilization is experiencing a self-inflicted wound. Yet if our educational institutions are of no help, surely our mental health professionals are. Alas, they are not. Most institutions have embraced what some call gender-affirming care meaning that when someone comes to them claiming they believe their gender is different than their sex, they do not seek to discover what might be causing this disconnect, rather they accept and affirm the individual's self-diagnosis and proceed from there. This affirming approach is now accepted by the likes of the American Medical Association, the American Psychological Association, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Thankfully, like Dr. McHugh, not all professionals out there agree with the transgender movement, but they are swimming upstream and often face public shaming and professional outcry. But think about it. Do we support a dangerously thin girl suffering from anorexia nervosa by affirming her self-image as fat and overweight? Do we help her by saying, you're right, if you truly believe that you are obese, then you are, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. No one can decide your truth but you. If we did this, we would not be helping that girl, we would be doing her harm. Imagine further if we then prescribed her medicines to curb her appetite and provided surgeries such as liposuction or stomach staples to help her remove fat and lose weight even faster to satisfy her self-identity as an overweight girl, all while she continued to waste away and suffer. There are disorders of identity that are very similar to what we see in transgender confusion. Scholars and researchers have written of distorted ethnic identity in which black individuals believe they are white and bodily integrity identity disorder in which healthy individuals identify as disabled and desire surgery to remove healthy limbs or induce paralysis artificially. For individuals such as these, whose view of themselves is distorted, no matter how passionately they may believe it to be true, 
we do not abandon them to those views or enter into their fantasy world. We work to bring them back into an acceptance of reality, an acceptance of the body with which they were blessed. And we would question the rationality and compassion of any civilization that simply affirmed their confused identities and allowed them to harm themselves. Why do we treat confusion about one's sexual gender any differently? In fact, there's evidence that helping people to transition to an appearance matching the other sex does not solve the individual's real and underlying problems. In his book, When Harry Became Sally, Ryan T. Anderson reports on evidence that should give us pause before we consider gender-affirming surgery to be a good solution to anything. The largest and most rigorous academic study on the results of hormonal and surgical transitioning, published in 2011 by Celia Dejean and her colleagues at the Karolinska Institute and Gothenburg University in Sweden, found strong evidence of poor psychological outcomes. For example, the rate of psychiatric hospitalization for post-operative transsexuals was about three times the rate for the control groups, adjusted for previous psychiatric treatment. The risk of mortality from all causes was significantly higher, and so was the rate of criminal conviction. Suicide attempts were nearly five times more frequent, and the likelihood of death by suicide was 19 times higher, again, after adjustment for prior psychiatric illness. It's important to note that this study comes to us out of Sweden and studied a huge number of individuals who were living in an area of the world renowned for its acceptance of transgender people. This tragic suicide rate can't be chalked up to oppression, discrimination, or a lack of societal acceptance and support, as it so often is in popular reporting. Yet even in the most transgender-accepting regions of the world, for those who undergo so-called sex reassignment surgery, the likelihood of death by suicide is 19 times higher, even after adjusting for other possible psychiatric problems. What a tragedy. Perhaps the saddest element in all of this discussion is how much of this is unnecessary. In his own survey of the history of studies on the subject, Dr. McHugh reports that 70 to 80% of children who report transgender feelings, yet who went untreated medically or surgically, eventually lost those feelings and accepted their biological sex and gender. They simply grow out of it. And yet, sadly, our society is gearing its educational systems, political systems, and social support systems to prevent children from simply growing out of it. Rather than let nature take its course, we are intervening with these children, even adding to their number and making their lives worse for it. How truly tragic. Abigail Schreier reports that Dr. Mahieu holds out hope writing, Dr. McHugh believes the transgender craze will likely end as the multiple personality craze did, in the courts with patients suing their doctors. Some of these teenage girls, he says, will wake up at age 23, 24, and say, here I am, I've got a five o'clock shadow, I'm mutilated, and I'm sterile, and I'm not what I ought to be. How did this happen? We can hope Dr. McHugh is right, that it's just a passing fad. After all, as long as this craze has a hold on our society, people will suffer for it. The signs aren't good. If anything, gender ideologues have expanded the conflict. Transgender activists have apparently come to recognize that deep down, we all know gender and sex are intimately linked. You really can't turn gender into a meaningless fantasy land because it is deeply tied to sex. And the binary reality of sex is undeniable. Male and female are real and fixed. As Ryan Anderson put in his book, 
The best biology, psychology, and philosophy all support an understanding of sex as a bodily reality and of gender as a social manifestation of bodily sex. Biology isn't bigotry. Yet our social engineers and gender identity overlords will not be denied. And if biological reality interferes with their plans, then they go to war against biological reality. And they appear to be winning. The trend among biologists now, at least publicly, is to treat not just gender as a continuous spectrum of possibilities, but also biological sex. And as some have noted, to publicly disagree is to risk your professional career and make yourself one more victim of cancel culture. As Exhibit A, I present Scientific American. In September 2017, Scientific American magazine published this infographic purporting to explain how human sex identification goes, quote, beyond XX and XY, referring to the XX chromosomes normally found in women and the normal XY chromosomes of men. Given the incredible amount of complex information, the infographic is impressive in its design. Graphics editor for Scientific American, Amanda Montanez, headed up the task, working with researcher and visualization expert, Amanda Hobbs, and data visualization studio, Pitch Interactive, to arrange information on disorders of sex development. Dr. Amy Vishnevsky, a University of Oklahoma expert in disorders of sex development, was asked to review and help ensure the resulting work was accurate. Now, I have the privilege of working with graphics designers in our editorial department, and I know that taking complex subjects and creating a visual means of making them more understandable is a challenging task. Of her project for Scientific American, Amanda Montanez is proud. As she says in her blog for the magazine, I am hopeful that raising public awareness of intersex along with transgender and non-binary identities will help align policies more closely with scientific reality and by extension, social justice. If you detect the possibility of bias in that statement, you may not be wrong. And as professional as the graphic may be, it also risks being very misleading. Let's look at it again more closely. The strip through the middle is meant to communicate a sense of a sexual spectrum and how non-binary it is supposed to be, similar to the sort of spectrum claimed by transgender activists. Typical biological females are exemplified by the extreme left end and typical biological males exemplified by the extreme right end with a vast space between them. Together, these two typical male and female areas only make up about 14% of the entire spectrum on the graphic, with the other 86% taken up by the space needed to detail all of the developmental disorders that Scientific American wants to label as intersex. The implication being that somehow those who fall into this range are not completely male or female, but something in between. However, if the graphic were modified to represent the actual numbers of individuals who exhibit these traits, we'd see something extremely different. Some reporting the most generous numbers concerning those who possess intersex disorders, such as Dr. Anne Fausto Sterling, claim that up to 1.7% of individuals should be considered in this intersex category. Using that measure, our spectrum would look something like this. A significant difference, right? However, others believe that even 1.7% is too large. Publishing in the Journal of Sex Research, Dr. Leonard Sachs has disputed that estimate, noting that it includes conditions that many clinicians do not consider truly intersex such as Klinefelter syndrome, Turner syndrome, and late onset adrenal hyperplasia. When we use a more precise definition of a true intersex condition, he says, quote, the true prevalence of intersex 
is seen to be about 0.018%, almost 100 times lower than Fausto Sterling's estimate of 1.7%. Looking at our graphic again, if the number of truly intersex disorders is reduced to 0.018%, then our picture changes all the more dramatically. In fact, even if you were watching this program on a screen of 4K resolution, we'd have to use the entire width of that screen for this image in order for the intersex portion of the so-called spectrum to make up little more than half of a single pixel. Using such disorders to claim that human sex is not binary, that there are somehow more than two human sexes is simply deceptive, even if innocently and mercifully intended. It's like noting that two in 10,000 human beings are born with a leg missing or only partially formed, and then declaring that humanity is not actually bipedal. Those with such disorders of sexual development are fellow human beings who deserve our love, care, and support, and to be treated with dignity. But using their condition to deny the biological reality of sex is outright deception and scientific malpractice in the name of social engineering. Biologist Colin Wright has addressed the deception behind claiming human sex is a spectrum in multiple media. In an article bluntly titled, Sex is Not a Spectrum, published on his delightfully named Substack newsletter, Reality's Last Stand, he highlights that claims of a hypothetical biological sex spectrum or of hypothetical sexes other than male or female are essentially an effort to help legitimize the idea of a gender spectrum. His clarity in terms of what makes one a male or female biologically is commendable and indisputable. But as someone with a mathematics degree, what I appreciated most was the way he uses a coin flip to make plain the reality of two biological sexes. By way of analogy, we flip a coin to randomize a binary decision because a coin has only two faces, heads and tails. But a coin also has an edge, and about one in 6,000, or 0.0166% of throws with a nickel will land on it. This is roughly the same likelihood of being born with an intersex condition. Almost every coin flip will be either heads or tails, and those heads or tails do not come in degrees or mixtures. That's because heads and tails are qualitatively different and mutually exclusive outcomes. The existence of edge cases does not change this fact. Heads and tails, despite the existence of the edge, remain discrete outcomes. No one disputes that a heads or tails coin toss is anything but fundamentally binary, or speaks of the results of a coin toss as existing on some sort of continuous spectrum, and neither should they do so with human sex and gender. There are two sexes, male and female. Anyone working hard to say otherwise is busy selling you something. Science is supposed to be about revealing truths about the natural world, not servicing social movements or political ideologies. Let's hope more scientists begin rediscovering the importance of truth in their communications and in their roles as stewards of the public trust. What is the real reason all of this is happening? How did our world get to a place where it so readily and willingly ignores reality? In fact, our civilization isn't simply ignoring reality, it's actively at war with it, seeking to eradicate all sense of what is real and replace it with baseless and dangerous fantasy. How did humanity come to such a place? Well, there is definitely a lot we could talk about, like postmodernism, critical theories, and various approaches to value deconstruction. And frankly, I enjoy those conversations. But there is a cause much deeper than all of that. And if we want to understand the truth behind all we are seeing, 
then we must be willing to dig all the way down to the very root of it all. And that root is man's willingness from the very beginning to ignore the purpose, design, and will of his creator. In the book of Genesis, we read of God's creation of the very first man and woman, Adam and Eve, and the lessons available in that book are profound and speak directly to this moment of cultural chaos and confusion that we are currently experiencing. For instance, in Genesis 1, beginning in verse 1, we read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, the words without form and void of verse 2 are translated from two Hebrew words, tohu and bohu, and they suggest a state of chaos and desolation. After the initial creation of the world, and for reasons we've explained in other programs and materials, the world had come to be in a state of devastation, ruin, and chaos, or tohu and bohu. Then in the rest of Genesis 1, we read how God orders this confusion to establish the foundation of the world. And he does so by establishing boundaries that bring order to it all. In verses 3 to 5 of Genesis 1, he separates light from darkness. In verses 6 to 8, he separates the waters below the atmosphere from the waters of the air and sky. In verses 9 to 10, he separates the water from the land. The Creator established order by placing much-needed boundaries where there were none. In verses 26 and 27, he declares a boundary between the animals, each of which is made according to its own kind, and humanity, which is made in his own divine image. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. Humanity is not like the animals. God created a distinction, separating us from the rest of the created world as unique bearers of his divine image. And in making mankind in his image, he chose to do that by creating two distinct categories within humanity, male and female. The record continues in verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. As male and female, our first parents were able to reproduce and bring children into the world, which was also part of his plan. The understanding of male and female is rooted in mankind's very design, in the nature of humanity as God designed it to be. And the Creator's design and purpose is the most fundamental foundation of reality. This is not merely an Old Testament thing, as some might say. The Gospel of John tells us that the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ was intimately involved in the creation of the world and man and woman saying, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. During his ministry, Jesus endorsed the creation of man and woman, distinct in sex and designed to marry one another. We see his teaching on the design of marriage, man and woman, and the originally created distinction between the sexes in multiple places, such as Matthew chapter 19, in verse 4, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? By the way, this illustrates that those who smugly claim Jesus Christ said nothing about the nature of sex, gender, and marriage are lying. They may be lying in ignorance of the biblical truth, but a lie is still a lie. 
God's binary plan for humanity as man and woman, male and female, is simple, beautiful, and obvious. In fact, when you think about it, by personally designing male, female, and the divine institution of marriage, God was establishing the fundamental unit of civilization, the family. The union of marriage provides a major foundational element upon which all of society is built. And he tells us through the words of the Apostle Paul that marriage and the roles of the sexes within it are designed the way they are to reflect the relationship of Christ and his church. And through the prophet Malachi, God explains his plan that biblical marriage, one man and one woman committed to each other for a lifetime in sacred union would serve as the environment for raising godly children. We here at Tomorrow's World know that marriage is vitally important for the role it plays in civilization, for what it teaches us about God, and of course, how it impacts all of our lives personally. Let me make sure you're aware that we do have a free booklet, God's Plan for Happy Marriage, that dives deeply into the fundamentals of having a satisfying and fruitful marriage in a way that we don't have time for on this particular program. If you'd like your own free copy of this booklet, just reach out using the information you see here on your screen. And when you think about it, is it any wonder that Satan the devil has attempted to deceive humanity throughout the centuries to degrade sexuality and the marriage covenant in various ways? As we've shown, that includes modern attacks at the most fundamental underpinnings of humanity and the family where we can't even make sense of the words male and female or man and woman any longer. Our Creator understood how vital it was to maintain the distinctions He created in the world's order, and He pronounced laws and statutes to help do just that. Uh, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, Moses reminds his fellow Israelites of God's direction, saying, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, of course, styles change over the centuries, and few of us wander around in clothing from 3,000 years ago. Yet within the many styles and variations mankind creates in the many cultures of the world, God expects the divine distinction between man and woman as he created them to be maintained and honored. The Apostle Paul wrestled against the dissolving of those boundaries in his own day, discussing hair length and such with early followers of Christ. Perhaps the liberating nature of life in Christ, in which women were respected and valued as equal partakers of salvation, so unlike the way women were treated in most other cultures of the day, uh, perhaps that had caused some of them to begin to lose sight of the divine design God instituted in humanity and the distinct roles the Creator had planned for man and woman. In reminding the Romans and Corinthians of these distinctions, distinctions to be maintained in personal appearance and in the clearly binary role of man and woman in sexual relations, Paul appealed to nature as additional evidence of God's design and the consequences of disrespecting that design. In speaking of those who had allowed their sense of personal wisdom to overrun their connection to God's design and laws, much like academics and social engineers of our own day, he wrote to those in Rome, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. It is true that sometimes acting on temptations to defy God's design of man and woman may feel right. In the book of Hebrews, the inspired words admit that sin often does feel right, but it warns in chapter 11 and verse 25 that those feelings represent passing pleasures. They feel right in the moment and may feel right for a long time, but the end is always the same. The pleasure passes, 
but the damage remains. With sin and the setting aside of God's will and design, there is always damage. Yet the same God who designed man and woman understands that we don't always make the wisest of choices. He understands that in a world completely deceived by Satan the devil, the path to what is right, good, and safe is often hard to find. He understands that in such a world, we're often tossed to and fro by forces early in our lives that we scarcely understand, let alone control. He understands that in that confusing world, we make mistakes, sometimes innocently, sometimes not, but mistakes nonetheless. We're promised that God does understand, as King David wrote in Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. In fact, the two verses preceding that give those who turn to him great hope. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That hope is available to those he calls to repent of their sins, to change their ways and turn to Jesus Christ and his Father completely and utterly in a spirit of obedience and total surrender. Those who do so can be forgiven of their past, washed clean of past sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, who died to make complete forgiveness available to all by paying the penalty of sin on our behalf. Then through the power of his spirit, Jesus Christ and his Father begin working inside us, sanctifying us and transforming us over the rest of our lifetimes, bit by bit, as Jesus lives his life over in us, building his character and reproducing his mind and outlook in us, making us true children of God to be born anew into a new and glorified life at his return. There is no promise that path is easy, quite the contrary. And in this life, while our sins can be completely forgiven, the consequences of past choices do not simply vanish like the dew at the rising of the sun. Yet we have the opportunity to replace our spiritual burden with a new burden, one so much lighter than the one we've been carrying. As Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, "'Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And those who commit to following him in obedience need no longer bear any burdens alone ever again. As the apostle Peter encourages us, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Those choosing to embrace sex and gender confusion are often doing so today looking for freedom. Yet the path to real freedom begins by embracing the truth. As Jesus pointed out long ago, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That freedom begins in this life and then finds its ultimate fulfillment in the glorified family of God at Christ's return and in the reign of the kingdom of God in the world where the lies of the devil will be banished. God's laws and design will guide humanity into peaceful coexistence and human beings of both sexes, man and woman, will find the meaning and purpose in their lives they've always longed for in their heart of hearts and wanted to understand. May God speed that beautiful day, and may the plain and simple truth about this subject guide you in your attempts to seek his face and find his purpose for you. From me and all of my fellow Tomorrow's World presenters, Gerald Weston, Richard Ames, and Rod McNair, and all of us here in the Tomorrow's World studios, 
We wish you the peace of mind that comes from embracing the truth of God, the faith of Jesus Christ, and the hope of his message of the coming kingdom. Until we see you again, take care.